thanks all for coming here uh, in such interesting times. Although I, I think I've seen talks with less people sitting in here in previous years. So maybe this whole situation motivates us more for, you know, uh, ap appreciate these, these, these uh, rare opportunities to exchange ideas in person. So I even said to people that uh, in Hungary this is the probably the only in-person conference this year in IT security, and although I've heard that maybe it's the only camp in Europe or something, or one of the few, so yeah, I, I'm really happy that, that we managed to come up with this. And uh, my talk was titled Climbing the Sphinx because uh, Sphinx was something that Steph worked on, and it got me intrigued the first time I heard about it, and uh, you know, it's something that you can climb, but the, the, the subtitle has a better descriptive value because that says that I'm going to talk about the journey while I try to port it to Android, but I'm not going to talk about Android because not many people are interested in that. We are not an Android conference. We are not at the mobile developer conference. It's more about what I encountered during this time. So that's me. Uh, I work uh, as a pentester for a, an IT security company called Silent Signal, which I co-founded with the close friends, and uh, I like testing mobile phone apps, so I have some insight into how to design and develop uh, mobile security, and that's why I thought that maybe I should do this task, and uh, I'm going to talk about some basics, so how this whole Sphinx works together because, for example, I, I guess most people last time heard about this stuff when Steph presented about this topic a year ago at the same camp or something like that. And uh, I want to bring everyone to a kind of a baseline where we start from the same point and we know where to go from there. And then I'm talk about, going to talk about distribution because Sphinx is a distributed system and how distribution is hard and how I find problems and then why secure protocol design is hard because it's, it's not something that you just come up with a pencil and paper and finish it in a day and it will be great. And then I have some wrapping up to see where we can go from here. So what is Sphinx? Uh, for those who will watch this from a recording and can, uh, for example, copy and paste the links, maybe it's easier to just uh, to just uh, look at these two videos. The first is in English, the second is in Hungarian. Both of them are made by Steph, uh, where he talks about what Sphinx is, how he implemented it, because the idea uh, is an acronym, a, s a store that perfectly hides from itself, no exaggeration. So it's a password manager, which is distributed, but while most other distributed password managers have a have a really bad threat modeling because they say that, yes, yeah, store all our passwords in a central location, we, we, we won't be able to touch it. Of course you won't. Uh, so it's, it, it's much better than these naive approaches of let's collect passwords at a central location. And he implemented this, these papers. Sphinx was a paper and he implemented it. And uh, you can access this implementation now. You can try using it and was implemented for desktop for, I guess, uh, Linux and Windows and Mac, maybe? Yeah, so it worked in some browsers. And uh, I wanted to port it to smartphones because uh, other than you having multiple desktops that you want to synchronize your passwords along with, I guess the, the most important one is having your passwords with you on the go because smartphone is a good thing if you want to quickly look something. You won't do it every day, but if you really need to do it at that time, at that location, it's a perfect device for that. So I try to port it to Android. And um, as I mentioned, Android here is not important. This, I guess, is the last slide that mentions Android. Maybe the closing slide, uh, the closing slide will be the other one. Uh, the most important thing is that I created an alternative implementation. And uh, the interesting thing I found is a similarity between software and uh, and uh, social dancing, is that. When you, when you just uh, have a stable partner with, with uh, dancing or you have a single implementation, you can fuck up because no one will notice because it will just work with itself. 
But as soon as you try changing dancing partners or you try to write an alternative implementation, then you realize, oh, here's this part in the specification which can be interpreted in two ways, and one implementation does this, another does that. Or for example, it's not distributed at all because it has some, some uh, some thoughts about, yes, this will work on the other machine as well, but there is some missing information which is not on the other machine, so it's not distributed at all. So that's what I've done. I created an alternative implementation, and as Steph mentioned, uh, NLNet was uh, great to support me in this because I tried implementing it in my free time, and then I realized that it's a much bigger task, and without NLNet funding, I probably would have finished in 10 years, but at least now I could work, do it as work, so that helped. And to get that baseline about Sphinx, uh, and this slide is mostly copied from Steph's presentation, although I use the LaTeX a bit better, but not that much better. So you have a password. The user enters it. This is, should be called a master password, but actually you, it can differ for different accounts. So the user enters a password, and then the and then there's these quotes around the user because now it's the user agent, the the program that is implementing Sphinx. This program chooses a whole random R, and then it calculates a hash of this uh, password or passphrase, and then raises to the power R, sends this called A to the storage. The storage returns this raised to a number K that is only known by the server. And then the storage returns this. And then the user can reverse that operation, uh, raising it to the random R. So it reverses that operation, and now it gets this value, which, it, which is dependent on the master password and is dependent on the K stored in the server. So you need both this information at the same time to have this uh, thing, I will call it RWD because that's what the source code. It's, one is password and RWD stands for random word. Random word, okay. At least now I learned something. And uh, so that, that's, that's the, the whole concept. And the great thing is that you can enter any password and you will get a result, not necessarily the valid result. So the whole point would be that even if the server is compromised, you have no problems because the, the server could be run by the NSA for what it's worth or any other similar organization because they wouldn't be able to do anything. So that's what Sphinx is. And I guess I will refer to this slide back uh, during my talk. So let's talk about distribution because it's, it's, it's an interesting topic. and. I guess since this, this whole Sphinx is distributed, this is a central problem. And uh, there was this original version that used these uh, ED25519 uh, keys for signing so-called management requests. What's a management request? Say I have an account on this uh, server. Now I want to change the password because some idiotic uh, a uh, server operator went against the NIST guidelines and said that you have to change your password every 30 days or, or if they've been compromised then maybe it's a legitimate request. But sometimes you need to change your password or you want to delete your account, why not? These are management requests and uh, the original version had these management requests signed so that only the user who created the, the account can for example, deleted it because otherwise it would be bad if someone else could delete your accounts. And uh, the problem was that there was a single key which was uploaded during the create request. So you said that, okay, we'll create a new account and this is the public key and only accept management requests for this account if it's signed by this public key. But since it was the same, for example, I ran this uh, little uh, script in shell, I could count that I have 12 uh, uh, things in the data directory where the file called pub, this is where the original implementation stored the, the public key. Uh, I SHA-256 summed it so I got a nice output and then I sorted them and said that uh, count the unique lines and I have 12 accounts that were tied to the same public key. So it's obviously bad because then the, the, if the server is run by a malicious sector, or if the server is compromised, we don't really care because the outcome is the same, they can 
have a, a really good idea which accounts belong together. It's not the full compromise of the system, but it's something that we can easily improve. Uh, for example, by, by having separate public keys. And of course, I could store these, but that would also be problematic. An easier uh, solution is uh, using the advantage of uh, these 255-19 keys, having this uh, uh, really good, really good uh, attribute that you can just use a random 32-byte sequence and use it as a seed for the key. So you can regenerate the key if you know the seed, and now you can generate them deterministically, unlike, for example, RSA keys, which have a bit of problems in this regard. So what we come up with is you generate a master key, and this is stored on your device. And then you use the so-called keyed hash, so a hash where you, where you need the same key and the same input to produce the same result. And then you can generate, any, generate a unique private key for every domain, and then you upload the public part. And you can forget about the private part because you can regenerate that anytime you want as long as you have the 32-byte key. So even if you have thousands of accounts, you still only need 32 bytes on the client to store that. And now, for example, if I, if I use this and I try to see how many different public keys I have, now I have thousands because all of them differ. They could belong to uh, 1,265 different users or the same user having this many accounts. There is no way I can tell as a server operator now. So th this was a uh, really, really good thing to find. Another thing is that say your device is compromised, the whole notion of using this distributed thing should be that even if my device is compromised, they cannot find anything because it's better, it has cryptography in it, it must be good. So, as I said, we had this key for signing management requests. How do we synchronize this key? And uh, uh, we had this, this idea of using QR codes because they can be easily read by a camera phone displayed on any screen so you won't have to deal with network security and everything, getting the two devices in the same network because it's a problem. And uh, because QR codes uh, get larger and larger with the more data you put in, uh, there it's kind of tricky to put binary data directly because it, it uses binary data, but many libraries don't expect this because most users are just, yeah, I just use base64 and put URLs into QR codes. No, I want to put binary data, so I, I even had to patch a library to get access to the raw data, but it worked. But the problem is, what if this key gets compromised? Then we get a denial of service situation because now anyone can delete a user's keys just because they have access to, to this uh, signing key. And uh, we, we were thinking about this and we didn't find a clear answer because we, we had the idea that what if we include this RWD, the random word, in the computation? In that case, uh, you do the full Sphinx cycle, so you act like you want to get your password again back from the server, and then use it part of the computation to get the signing key that can be then used to actually sign the request to delete or remove or change the password. If we include it, then we have another problem, problem because if someone compromises the user's master key and the server, or already owns the server, as with NSA, now it's possible to do an offline brute force on the master key, because otherwise, for every valid master key, you get a valid-looking password, and you have to do an online brute force on the real website where the account belongs to. But in this case, it can be turned into offline brute force. So you have to make a trade-off between is my, uh, is my availability more important or is my confidentiality is more important. So right now we are thinking about uh, making a kind of switch into the application to, so that the user can make an informed decision whether they want to accept this risk or that risk because it depends. Some people will say, I, I don't give a fine fuck about uh, my accounts being deleted while I'm more conscious about my passwords getting stolen or the other way around. So it's a trade-off. There is no, no silver bullet. And uh, 
here I can show you the part of the solution. It's in Kotlin, which is an interesting language. And uh, we, are, uh, we are going top down. So when we want to do an authentication, we just say that, OK, read the nonce from the server. So the server sends a nonce. And then we sign that with the signing key. But how do we get the signing key? Well, we create it from a seed by folding the signing constant, the ID that we want to authenticate. The ID is something like username at hostname, but hashed so the server doesn't see it. And the RWD, the random word, which we got into this. So if I remove that, there will be no need for uh, a valid password, but then you can get a denial of service situation. And this is. Uh, just a simple transformation so that I create a beautiful list of what to hash together uh, so that I can use fold because there are some closure people here who like using fold because it's more beautiful than using a, a, a simple for loop. Actually, I, I also like it better. So this is how it works and, and uh, that's how we solve this problem. And then, of course, we have the problem of UX. A user goes on a website, and now whether he or she remembers the username for that site is important because the username, as I mentioned, is also calculated as part of the hash. So if you don't remember the username, you cannot get the password as well. So either you remember all your usernames correctly, or you need to store them somewhere. And the original implementation that's just stored it locally, which is easy and, and works every time, but it's a pain in the ass to synchronize across devices. So it should be stored on the server as well. But then all the devices need to have read write access because you probably want to have the ability to add accounts on all devices, deletes accounts on all devices, otherwise it's not a really distributed system. So we said that, okay, now we need an end-to-end -end encrypted uh, blob storage. So the server just stores a bunch of bytes and uh, then gives it back. Of course, it's the duty of the client to encrypt it because if we trusted the server to encrypt it, then we wouldn't be in this trouble. And we decided we'd want, we won't use uh, this authentication here. Um, I guess it's fine, but if you have any idea why it's not fine, I mean, the, the attacker model in this case would be if someone compromises the devices of the user, they can get access to which usernames they have accounts to on specific sites. I mean, they probably already have access to the user, the, the HTTP caches of the browser if they compromise the device. So I guess it's on the same level. Yeah? Uh, I was going to say basically the same thing, except from a passive global observer perspective. Yeah, so. Ah, okay, yeah. Yeah, that's that's good for one attacker model, but when, when you already have the key, you can also decrypt the responses. So use that, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. But then you need a way to create valid looking answers that can be decrypted with the user's key. So it's it's interesting, but then you can also create decoy keys. So yeah, it's, it's a deep, deep, deep hole. <laughs> uh, and we also thought about using OPEC because that was also part of the same talk. Uh, the links uh, also apply in the first slide. Uh, that could have been also used for this stuff, but then we wouldn't have had the flexibility to implement this, this trade-off option because OPEC works in one way and not others. So, so even though it would have been really beautiful and, and we were like, oh, it's so good. It's, it's, it's the typical thing with engineers and, and programmers when they say, this system would look so nice, but 
it's usually not a matter of whether it looks looks nice to developer, but the other way around, whether it's good for the user, it has good security properties. Uh, so yeah, th that was the end of it. And now we get to the protocol design, which is also interesting. So the original version had the notion of uh, storing uh, the password rule on the server. But what's a password rule? So you get the random word, the RWD, but that's just a long number. Let's treat it that way. And it has high entropy, which is good, but we need to turn it into some password which can be used on the target site, which might have different policies. So for example, we have a, the, the biggest Hungarian consumer bank has a limitation of eight characters on the password maximum. Yeah, let's not talk about that. So, so if you have a site that has restrictions, you need to come up with a way, and Steph came up with <clears throat> encoding uh, in a bitmask what character classes are supported, because some places restrict the character set as well. Let's not talk about that as well. And how long the password should be. And these should be stored on the server, because these need to be distributed as well, because otherwise they won't be transmitted to other devices. You have a question, and um, so this is this obviously also needs to be encrypted and then uploaded next to next to the rules. So when when the when the when the client asks for it, it gets the random word and the rules, and now these two can be used to create the password. Great. Uh, the problem is that the original protocol ran directly over TCP. And it was okay for most purposes. I mean, it's, again, the beauty in the eye of the engineer. Since the RWD has already been blinded with, with that uh, R factor, it can't be used by anyone who doesn't know what R is. And R is generated on the client and is thrown away immediately. And it's high entropy, so it cannot be guessed. So, so it's not a problem. The request had no personal information because it only co contained the, the ID, but that was also encrypted with the server's public key. So no problem there. The problem is that the response contained this end-to-end -end encrypted rule. And now you may be thinking, why is that a problem? It's end-to-end -end encrypted. What's, what's the problem here? And I'm, I show you the diff where we fix the problem. So just think about it. If you read a file, which is not written anywhere else, only at password creation. And it, it, we fail if it's not found. And then we send it back to the user along with this Sphinx value. So we have a file which has a content that doesn't change. We didn't, don't care about the content, but we send it directly over plain TCP. So it can be used to track when the user requests the same account again, because this will stay the same. I don't know what's in it, but I can track that the same account is requested that I saw last time. So it, again, not a complete uh, compromise of the system, but a really nice side channel that may be used in some interesting attack, because just look at how browsers are attacked these days. You have many, many small bugs, info leaks, and side channels, and then they can be combined with, to a great attack. So. Yeah, and, the pro and, and it's really nice because it's, you, you don't even need to do a man-in-the-middle attack. Simple eavesdroppers can listen to these. Uh, so we came up with this intermediate solution, because we'll have a better one in next slides, that uh, you can actually convert between these two 5519 keys. And uh, you can convert one that can be used for signing to one that can be used for encryption. And then the server does another layer of encryption. So the inner layer is used so that the server doesn't know about my rule. And then the outer layer is used so that uh, traffic analysis becomes impossible because this uh, pack thing will be different every time it's us. So again, all the bytes will be different. So this is what we came up with. And then come the other problems. We, we go deep into this hole, uh, but I, I promise we'll come up to the surface. Uh, so we encrypted the request with the server's key, fine. But what is prohibiting me to just sending the same request I captured from the network again and again and again? So they can be replayed. And there is, of course, no forward secrecy. So if someone goes to the server 
uh, and uh, after storing years worth of, of network traffic, gets the server private key either from a backup or actually breaking or maybe having the legal power to get those keys, they can use it to retroactively decrypt all previous communications. And that's a problem. That, that's why we only have forward secrecy key exchange in TLS 1.3, because it's a problem. Although I've heard that some banks don't like it. And, uh, and the other problem is that, yes, it's not TLS and, and it doesn't needed really TLS, but many firewalls, they block things they don't understand. And that's the same thing with random ports. So if you use it on a mobile phone, you might only have access, for example, down here, you don't have a mobile phone network connectivity, but you have Wi-Fi. But if that Wi-Fi blocks these ports, then you're out of luck. Even though you can enter the website that you want to log into, you cannot get your password because you cannot get through to the Sphinx server. So. So I managed to to uh, to tell Stefan, and he I managed to get him agree with me on that TLS should be used against uh, instead of this homemade protocol. Even though the homemade protocol had really great ideas, and I liked it from an engineering perspective, TLS is better because they solve these replay attacks because they have whole separate units of using key exchange, using random injected into that and stuff. And also it's in the understood by middle boxes. So we solve a UX problem in a way. Also with this PKI, previously you needed to have the server's public key for the whole system to work because you need to use that to encrypt the request. Now you just need, you can use it as a hardening. I mean, uh, Keeping is a valid uh, protection technique for hardening systems. But if, if your attack model doesn't include that, then you can just use a PKI and uh, use a Let's Encrypt certificate and, and it will just work. And also, TLS is not as bad as it was. I mean, we have these nice attacks, mostly against TLS 1.0 and 1.1. And uh, actually, for example, now you can use uh, elliptic curve uh, certificates. I, for example, use uh, some elliptic curve certificates with Let's Encrypt. It works, and it's much quicker to do a, do a handshake because of that. Although there is an RFC for for uh, putting uh, 255.19 keys into certificates, so they have the the assigned numbers so that the implementation can interoperate together. The problem is that the CAB forum, the CA browser forum, which basically tells what the commercial CAs to do, they have this document on what key sizes to use, and they only mention the three NIST curves and nothing else. So according to this, no CA should be able to, to create such a key, uh, sign such a key. And it's, it's, so if you create your own system, it can even work with those keys. There are instructions on the internet to do, for example, OpenSSL supports it. But uh, for example, there's a thread on Let's Encrypt forum where users asked, will you support it? Why are you not supporting it? And they said they won't uh, burn their uh, pricey engineering time to work on something that might not be included in the CAB uh, things in the next few years. So. If it won't work, why waste the time? Although I've heard that Chrome is working on it, so maybe this will be a reality. But even then, you can you already have something that's better than RSA, even if it's not that good as uh, 25619. Also, we have uh, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman exchange, which can use 25519 uh, because that's not governed by the CAB forum. And you can also use ChaCha and Poly to as as uh, cipher suits. So. Most of our crypto is already in TLS, uh, but they've covered many more edge cases than we had. So, And also if you have uh, multiple commands after each other, so for example, you create an account and then you want to, uh, in five minutes, check again for the password, then you can use session resumption so that you won't have to go through all this TLS uh, handshake, so it will be even faster. So. 
I guess TLS is not that bad. So we switched to TLS and now half of the crypto went out the window. It's a really satisfying change. If you look up my repository, the one commit where I removed around half of the crypto code because we switched to TLS. And some final thoughts. So I guess we could still improve on lots of things. I, we, we just didn't have the time yet. Uh, for example, there was this interesting thing since March that prevented us from doing most of our work like we used to do. So for example, uh, right now a rule, as I said, contains how long the password should be and what character set it should use. But I guess we could add the XOR mask, an exclusive OR mask, so that you, you can store passwords in, in the same way you would store it in a regular password storage. So, I have a password and don't give me a new password, I want to store my existing password because, for example, it's for a system where I either cannot change the password or I'm not allowed to change the password. These conditions exist and, of course, we should educate users to use these generated passwords, but if, if that's not the thing, you can still use it because you'll just sort the resulting random word and you still get the nice properties because with, if, if you could just use, use blob, then the problem is that you can decide whether you've had a valid password or not. If you use Sphinx with this XOR mask, then you have the nice property of not being able to tell whether you got the correct password or not. Uh, also, for example, in Android, I, uh, now this is the slide where I mentioned it, I, I tried to integrate it into the system's native uh, password uh, sharing functionality. So on Android, there is really high privilege separation. So I'm not in the browser process. The browser offers the users, do you want to fill the login information with this program? And when they say yes, I only get access to what fields they have on that page and I don't have access to the whole uh, memory of the, of the browser process and I can say, okay, return this information. And they, they can also recognize, for example, if the user is asked for his credit card and then I could say that, yeah, you can store your credit cards here if you want to, but then again, that's also an information that, that you already have and cannot change. So with the mask, you can store it as a string of digits and for example if you don't include the check digit an attacker cannot tell when he got the correct uh, uh, master password so yes i think this would be a good idea but then we have this this problem which which is intertwined with this and uh, as i mentioned we encrypt the the password rule using lipsodium and it has this nice secret box thing where it not only encrypts, but provides integrity uh, protection in the same package. But it's a problem for us, because now, even though we have this whole beautiful Sphinx system around us, we can tell if it's the, if it's the good master password. So we just throw the whole thing out on the window. So we, we, for, uh, yeah, so this integrity protection needs to be switched for one that 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 cannot be decided that well. But but uh, for example, plausible deniability. I can give you any password and it will produce a convincing looking result or online brute force. So in that case, you, he needs to test it online with the original uh, website. So you you yeah. It's problematic. Uh, so my better plan would mean that first we remove this integrity protection, but that means we are writing low-level crypto, so it needs to be checked by many eyeballs so that we don't screw it up. And that's the explicit part. We might still have implicit. So for example, if right now we have these, uh, these bit masks, if there are bits that are always zero, that can be used as an oracle, whether it's a valid result. If the length of the password is, is implausible because they already know which side they are looking for, that's also a problem. So we need to come up with something that's, that can mask it. Maybe we don't even need to have this encrypted. It's, it's, an, it's, a, it's not that easy. And maybe once we remove these, we can add an, op an optional thing where we, for example, store some bits of the random word so that you can tell the user when they, for example, mistyped their, pa their master password. But if you store low enough bits, 
it's still a reliable way. So for example, if you, if you store four bits, now there is one in a 16 chance that even though the check digit is okay, the master password was bad. And for an attacker, having one sixteenth of the password to check is not that big of an improvement. We are talking about much larger sets. But for a user, having this idea of with a 15 out of 16 chance of having a great sign that, yeah, you mistyped the password, it's not that bad. So I guess this could be improved. And of course, this is the closing one because now I show you where the Git repo is. So it's in Kotlin, which is an interesting language developed by actual developers. So it was not designed by a corporation to fit their um, agenda. So it's, it's not only compilable to JVM, but to native code as well, without any Java in it. So for example, it can be used for an iOS port. So if someone is fluent in iOS, they can just reuse most of the code base and compile it directly, and it will run on iOS devices as well. Uh, the graphical interface is mostly complete, so it's not self-explanatory. So it still needs some help text at places, but the core functionality is there. So for example, I tried using it, and it works. And uh, pull requests are welcome. So it's up on GitHub. Anyone can see the code, try it for themselves. Uh, it's strict to get a server because they are, you know, it's intertwined. So if you change something on the server which affects the protocol, you also have to change the client as well. But, but you can actually use the v2 branch from Steph's uh, software and use my Android Sphinx and they will probably work together. Uh, so if you find anything that doesn't work or, or you can improve on it, well, free food to submit one of those. And uh, that's what I want to tell you. Thanks. <laughs> Questions? Hattie. What's the biggest challenge implementing on Android? Um, in this case, it was probably because that was my first time using uh, uh, native libraries, so I reused the C implementation of Staff. So I had to adjust the build environment so that I can cross compile it to ARM and 64-bit ARM, and and even on x86. You can't just transfer because even though I use Linux on my machine and Android is, has a Linux kernel, they have different uh, libc. Uh, Android uses, um, uh, how do you say, the more liberally licensed Bionic libc, not the GNU libc. So, sorry? And the different, like, yeah, that's just, that's just putting more salt into the wound, yeah. So, <laughs> so it's, it's like, Nothing, nothing that you would see on your machine. So even on x86, you have to cross-compile it because, for example, running in a virtualized environment so that you can test in an emulator, it's much faster if you use an x86 Android because then you can use your built-in native CPU virtualization. So for me, that was the hardest part, and I knew about it because that's about, I think, 30% of the budget I allocated for. And, and, and it, it was a good job. Yeah. Yes, it is. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, and it was. It, it's. It's not really that much documented because it's not used by many people. So even those people who use NDK, most of the time they just use the library that's been already compiled by someone else. So for example, for Libsodium, I just put a line into the configuration and it just downloaded the pre-compiled Libsodium for Android and it just worked and they had the wrappers around it. But doing it from scratch with a library that was not designed with this in mind, it, it was annoying. And, and of course, once you have it, it looks simple because it's just, yeah, there's a shell script that sets some, some variables and then it, it just works. But getting to that shell script, <laughs> It's, uh, I think that that was the hardest part.